All right, so we've been talking about animal diversity and you've seen that there's all sorts of animals. A lot of them are worms. Most of them are, are invertebrates, meaning they don't have a backbone. So we've talked about the simplest animals, which were sponges, which had no symmetry, lacked tissues, pretty much were just a bunch of cells living together, filtering water and, and so forth. And then we moved to jellyfish, which had radio symmetry, meaning you can divide them in any different directions. They had stinging tentacles and a mouth and an anus that was the same hole. They often had uh, both sex parts, male and female. And that was also true, I believe, for a lot of these other animals. Um, flatworms were a good example of an animal that uh, didn't really have much in regards to a circulatory system. It had a body cavity, had simple kidneys. You could cut a flatworm in half and it would regrow. Um, it didn't have a body cavity like we have. Then we went to uh, earthworms or, or roundworms, which were microscopic, or they could be really large depending on what type of roundworm we had. We noticed that some of them could cause trichinosis by the trichinella nematodes. Some are parasites of plants. And then we had talked about rotifers, which were a little invertebrates that could live in streams and, and ponds and so forth. Then we moved to mollusks, and you'll see that there's all sorts of mollusks, right? From very seemingly very intelligent ones like octopus and squids that can do a lot of problem solving, the simpler ones like slugs and snails and so forth. And then we had our annelids, which were our, our earthworms. They have uh, body cavities, they have simple hearts. Um, they are often hemoaphroditic, meaning that they have both sexes. Some of them are leeches. Um, some of them obviously are important for turning over the soil and breaking down and making soil you know, rich again with nutrients. Then we talked about our arthropods, which were our things like insects and um, lobsters and crabs and so forth. Then there's, so now what we're doing is moving into animals that are kind of like pre-backboned animals and those that have a true backbone. These include our starfish, which um, are surprisingly closely related to backboned animals than all these other animals. And the reason why is that they are, all right, so now we're gonna talk about starfish. That's strike two, next strike, you're up here. Um, all right, so, this is our starfish here. Um, you can see that it doesn't really have cephalization. Does anybody remember what cephalization was? Well, if you remember, cephalization is having that head, the eyes forward. A lot of animals have cephalization. But as you can see, starfish don't. Surprisingly, starfish can move around ra rather rapidly. If you remember from watching um, that movie with the octopus, a starfish can move in on the octopus when it was starting to eat that crab and try to get some of that crab meat. So they can move around relatively quickly. Um, they have these uh, spines on them. They tend to have five parts. Um, they do have um, larvae that have bilateral um, symmetry. But again, they have no brain, simple nervous system water vascular system with tubes and feet and uh, autonomy, it seems like. You might wanna watch a video on these. These are still kind of animals I don't know a whole lot about. Now let's start talking about animals. We'll show a few little clips at the end or in your lab of these animals. But now let's talk about our phylum that we belong to called phylum chordata. These are animals with backbones. Um, not all of them have backbones, though. Some of them have a um, more of a um, made of cartilage kind of like backbone, 
it's either way is a dorsal hollow nerve cord. And so the simplest of these animals are these animals like this one here, which is cephala cordata and ura cordata. These are animals that are closely, and evolutionarily speaking in quotes, pretty closely related to this. Obviously they're far removed from us from billions of years or millions of years anyway. Um, but they do have something that's kind of like a backbone and that's why they are put in with our group. We are ver vertebrates. We have a true backbone. So these eukaryotic, urochordata and cephalochordata have something that's kind of like a primitive backbone. I'm just trying to make sure you understand that called a notochord. That we vertebrates, which include fish and birds and amphibians and reptiles, all have a true backbone. And that's what we're going to talk about mostly today. They also have a post anal tail. So even we have a kind of a tailbone. So chordata, animals with this kind of backbone ish structure, have a post anal tail. And do you remember when I was showing you at the beginning of the semester? that some of the embryos of birds and humans and all sorts had kind of like little gill slits as embryos. Well, those uh, farginal slits or gill slits are something that you see in embryos or as adults um, in some of the animals. So let's talk about our phylum. So remember kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. So we're still relatively high up there. So we're gonna talk about phylum chordata. They have this notochord. And in the case of us, we have a backbone that comes from that kind of that notochord where there's around 48,000 species of us creatures that have backbones. So if you look at these animals here, these are the animals with backbones. You'll recognize a lot of them, right? Here we have our, on the far side, we got our birds and our crocodiles. You'll see our lizards and snakes mammals. And then on the left side, you see more of the different types of fish from bony fish, like our fish that you'd catch out at Spring Lake, to our fish that are made up of cartilage, like our um, sharks, our skates, our rays. And then we have lungfish and, uh, and all sorts of different kinds of fish. So these are representative of backbone vertebrates. So that's a subphylum. The most primitive of these fish were these sea lampreys, or, or among the most primitive. They didn't really have a true jaw like you see when, you, when you're out fishing for bass. They don't they have a real jaw. You've seen bass fish, they have real jaws. These lampreys don't, but they are pretty good at being parasites. They got these rasping teeth and they can basically drill a hole into the meat and either and suck on the blood and so forth. It depends on the sizes of them and stuff like that, but they didn't have a real jaw for the most part. So these are very, very primitive fish, these lampreys. You can see them up on the board right here. Here's a sea lamprey feeding on officials. In some cases they're parasitic, I believe, and in other cases, I guess they're obviously able to feed. <clears throat> so it seems like these gill slits <coughs> may have been a path towards developing or evolving jaws because the simplest fish had gill slits that have those rasping teeth but they don't have true jaws but it seems like when they lose these gill slits and these gill arches it begins to form a jaw-like structure so that's what's being shown in this picture here at the top you see the most primitive fish without jaws and it seems like some of these gill arches and slits were modified evolutionarily into jaws. And so that's what we're seeing here. So that's some of the ideas about the evolution of how jaws came about. Not the shark, of course, but how they, the actual gill slits and ridges might have formed the jaws that we have in vertebrates today. Now, let's start talking about fish. These are pretty cool, right? These are our nathostomes. This is a class of fish. And um, these include those made of cartilage. They I think it's called chondro chondrichthyes or something like that. I might be, I'm pronouncing it probably wrong, of course. But they're made up of cartilage. And these include our sharks, our skates, and our rays. And so here you can see some representatives of that group. Here we have 
a stingray on the far right. We have our different sharks. As you know, probably know this from watching Shark Week or something like that, those teeth are constantly replaceable. So they can lose teeth all the time. Um, and then they have another set of rows of teeth come up. They can, they can lay eggs or they can have something that's kind of like a live birth where they have eggs inside them, inside sharks, depends. Some will lay eggs like this one over here on the right, or the eggs will hatch inside the mother. And in some crazy cases, the embryos will eat each other. So they'll actually have cannibalism going on inside their mother. And then she'll release uh, a shark that ends up being the winner of that cannibalism that went, took place in her womb. Isn't that crazy? So there's all sorts of strange and interesting stories that occur with sharks. Obviously they're extremely successful. They've been around for millions and millions of years. They're really good at doing what they do. Swim fast, eat something, and make more sharks, as you might have seen from the movie Jaws. So they're really amazing. Then you start seeing more rayfid fin fish, and then you see some coelacanths, and then you see lungfish. These are fish that can breathe air and came out. And so this is some of the reasons why we think um, fish that could hobble onto land and breathe like these mud lungfish, or the, maybe the first animals that could move to land and then become amphibians and then reptiles, mammals, and so forth. That's the reasoning behind it anyway. Does that make sense, Sterling? <clears throat> what do they have um, that allows the fish to go up and down in a, swim, in a column of water, do you know? What is it kind of like a ballast that helps them to float, if that's the right word? Well, they have a swim bladder, so they can put air. So bony fish, not, no, not sharks and, and rays, but bony fish like the bass you cal, catch outside, they have swim bladders that allow them to float up and down. So the idea is that the swim bladder and lungfish may have evolved to become lungs or lung structures. Here's examples of ray finned fish. Um, even this moray eel, you might not have realized that moray eels are a type of fish. Even a sea dragon or a, a seahorse are fish. They're just very highly modified and evolved to look like the algae that they're floating in. What do we know about this fish on the far left? Or my far left, anyway, might be your far right. That's no, your left also. What do we call that? A lionfish? Do you guys know how it can be very poisonous if, if somebody tries to eat it? So the, anyway, fish are amazing creatures, as you can guess. Here is a lungfish on the bottom. It's capable of living in oxygen-poor environments because it can go up and gulp some air and take that air and survive. And then the idea is that these fins of some of these fish became more leg-like and allowed them to climb up on land temporarily. And, and what happens is there's this, and you don't have to worry about memorizing or understanding this fully because this is obviously a complex topic, but there are these group of things called Hox genes that are in you and every animal, maybe every vertebrate anyway. And it doesn't take much to change these genes to make something a wing and an arm or a leg or a fin. It's just modifications of these genes. And so it seems like it wouldn't take much to modify a fin of a lobed fin fish to become something leg-like. And so there are uh, fossils of these kind of what seemingly are transitional species that even found by the, a guy that works, worked at the, I don't know if he's still there, but the guy that worked at the National History Museum in Chicago, I believe, or at least gave a talk there, maybe I've forgotten. But they have, they found fossils of these kind of transitional fish-like, amphibian-like creatures um, in, you know, as fossils, you find rocks and stuff like that. So that's where some of this ideas come from. And so this leads us to the next group of animals that have to live close to water for the most part, amphibians. 
They have three chambered hearts. By the way, fish have two chambered hearts. Fish, amphibians have three chambered hearts. You have a four chambered heart. Crocodiles and lizards have four chambered hearts. So again, amphibians have three chambered hearts. So they're not as good, their hearts are not as good at respiring, but they don't do as much. They're not warm blooded, they're cold blooded creatures. Fish are generally cold blooded creatures also. Ectothermic is the way we call it scientifically. There are exceptions like tuna, I believe can do some pretty amazing things. And it doesn't mean that they're necessarily primitive, but they are, their body temperatures are more reliant on the sun and the temperature of the environment. Now these amphibians, as you know, have to live near water or they will desiccate usually. Now there are some tricks that some of them do to live out and survive a drought where they can get into some wet soil and, and basically hibernate of some sort. But generally speaking, they need to live near water. They need to put their eggs in the water so that you can have tadpoles and larvae that can swim and survive. Even this worm-like, snake-like thing on the left side is an amphibian, believe it or not. So here we have a salamander, frogs, and so forth. Now, one of the biggest adaptations of getting onto land was being able to get your eggs to survive in dry environments. Because remember, amphibians need to have their legs in water, or generally speaking, or their eggs will dry out and they'll die. Um, eggs were an important part of evading, you know, we have small, you know, we have eggs that we found in fish and so forth. The big thing about eggs is they have these big yolk sacs that allow them to gather nutrients. So because they're not going to be getting it from like us, when mothers were the baby gets the has the uh, ability to take the nutrients from the mother's blood. In this case, the yolk is the nutrients of um, egg living creatures. Now, the difference between an aquatic animal like the amphibian and a lizard is, Lizards and turtles, they can put a kind of a leathery shell around their egg and prevent the egg from desiccating and drying out. While amphibians, they, their, their eggs are still absorbing water and need to stay moist. Does that make sense? So that was a big thing that's different too. Um, this here is their waste product. So you can see that they take the nutrients from the yolk and then they put their waste that would be like anything that doesn't get digested properly or fecal matter into this allantosis. So it's, it gets as big as the embryo. And then the yolk gets smaller as the, egg, as the embryo begins to fill up the egg. So that moves us to reptiles. Now reptiles are more able to obviously live on dry land and deserts and all sorts of things. That's because they started getting a tough, leathery skin that wouldn't um, dehydrate to the environment. Because remember, amphibians, their skin is uh, permeable to water usually. So they can take in water, move it out, and get rid of waste products. So a big movement into you know, evading the land and becoming evolving to land is being able to have skin that does not dehydrate yourself. They also developed kidneys that were better at conserving water. So that's a big thing also. So here's examples of different reptiles. We got our, our turtles, turtles and tortoises and, and crocodiles and, and snakes and, and lizards and so forth. And then of course we had dinosaurs at one time as well that were the major animals before something killed them off. We think it might've been an asteroid or something like that. And we started to see some fossil evidence of feathery dinosaurs. Um, and this is one of the reasons why we think birds evolved from dinosaurs, not Tyrannosaurus rex or something like that, or Brontosaurus, but, but small lizards, reptiles, dinosaurs, that had some, some feather-like structures. We don't know what the feathers might've been for initially, 
Maybe it was a way to, you know, to show off. Maybe it was to help them glide down from a tree or, or if something was chasing them, they can kind of flutter away before really developing the ability to fly. There's a lot that isn't really known about that. And certainly something that you would learn in a different class if you wanna know more details about that. So this actually leads us to the class Aves, because remember kingdom, phylum, class. Aves is birds. And again, what is a, the cool thing about birds is of course is they are one of the few groups of animals that really take into flight. Um, you can see that even their limbs still have the same bones that our limbs have. A humerus and radius, there's a forearms, their fingers, you can kind of see where that is. And then you got these flight feathers coming off of it, but they're all about staying as light as possible, generally speaking. So their bones are hollow, much more hollow, but strong in comparison to their weight. And then of course their feathers are their biggest modifications. We think that feathers evolved from scales because they're very scale-like, this except in size. They don't have teeth anymore either. Of course they have beaks. They do have four chambered hearts like us and they are warm blooded like us. And then this leads to mammals, which also we think evolved from reptiles. Um, they have hair. So all these animals have hair or fur. You can call hair fur, it's the same basic thing. They all give live birth. Um, Ex the only exception would be our what, or maybe two exceptions, the monotremes, which are platypus and stuff like that. Um, they all do provide milk to their young through um, what I call modified suspicious glands, which are basically modified sweat glands, as you would call them breast or mammary glands. All these animals are able to provide milk that includes our dolphin down here. Again, a dolphin is the idea of what is it evolved from a, a land-like animal. And we have some evidence for that as well, looking at their hip structures. Based on the fossil evidence we saw around 220 million years ago, these um, fossils. And they really started to flourish after the dinosaurs went extinct. So these animals weren't running around getting eaten by Tyrannosaurus rex. They were at that time, probably little rodent-like creatures that just hid in corners. And then of course we have our primates, which includes, and I've talked about these before and showed you videos on them before, if you remember. I talked about chimpanzees and gorillas a little bit and orangutans, those are all apes, um, highly intelligent, no tails. And then we have our monkeys, those are animals with tails. So that kind of gives you some basics of the rest of the animals that um, included our animal diversity lecture. Binocular vision is big in primates, by the way, too. You know what binocular means? The eyes in front. Predators do that as well as primates. That's for helping cue in on your food. What do herbivores do? They have their eyes near their sides, right? So they can watch their tail. All right, so that concludes uh, the diversity lecture. And then we're gonna look at a couple animal examples and then we'll take a nice mass break and let you, um, after you watch a few animal videos, do something else. Um, so anyway, those can be seen in the lab or later. <laughs>